and privilege to still invite our speaker to present to us what he has for this uh, pre-conference workshop, which is on recent advances in predictive model assessment. Professor, the online is for you for the present. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, first of all. Uh, thank you to the entire committee for inviting me um, to this uh, important conference. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, even though I would have preferred to talk to you in person. Um, well, this is also one way of it. Uh, so um, when the organizers asked me uh, which topic you want to talk about, I thought about talking about something that's actually closely con connected to my research and also to the uh, pre-conference workshop which uh, will be run um, on Friday. Um, so I decided to talk a bit about recent advances in uh, PLS SEM, so partially squares, structure equation modeling, more, ex uh, more specifically about predictive model assessment. And to set the stage a bit, um, let me show you um, a little picture of this young man here. And um, well, might not look familiar to you, I guess. Well, at least uh, the picture didn't look familiar to me either, but this is actually um, a man called Edmund Halley. And Edmund uh, Halley was an English astronomer, uh, geophysicist, mathematician, meteorologist, and physicist. So like really a wizard of his time. And um, he contributed some very important research work uh, to astronomy, for example, um, he traced the transit of the Mercury across the sun and also um, his works really facilitated the drawing of star maps. He actually added Isaac Newton's, um, like proving uh, Isaac Newton's law of motion and based on his works, basically he traced the periodicity of a comet, which later became known as Halley's Comet, uh, in his 1705 synopsis of the astronomy of comets, which was a seminal work by him. Well, in this work, which you can basically see here, lots of numbers, lots of complicated figures, he actually um, wrote the following. Hence, I dare venture to foretell that it will return again in the year of 17. 58. So it is, in this case, a comet, and he wrote this in 1705. So unfortunately, um, Halley did not uh, live to see his prediction actually come true, but it actually happened. And here you see a picture of this Halley's comet upon his first appearance in our solar system, which was 1986. So it was actually not the verifiability of the explanations that had a lasting impression on the people's minds. It was actually the prediction of this particular event. Yeah? So while the causal explanation that they did with all these numbers and graphics and so on really facilitated uh, the understanding of the phenomenon in this uh, time here, the periodicity of the comet, it was actually the exact prediction that was like making the impression here. And in, uh, the prediction notion is actually not, nothing new and it's been uh, a fundamental building block of science. Like mirrored in this statement here by Richard P. Feynman, I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Yeah, he was a Nobel Prize winner here. But yet it's unmatched predictive accuracy actually helped spark the semiconductor revolution. Similarly, in the social sciences, like in marketing, for example, which is my area of research, there's been the notion that uh, prediction is of fundamental importance. Uh, like here in this seminal work in the Journal of Marketing, if marketing research is to perform a useful function, it must be put finally in the terms of predictions for the use of management, yeah, with the notion that marketing is actually an application-oriented science which needs to derive actual recommendations for practice. Also from a more, say, scientific philosophical point of view, there's uh, lots of support for prediction. Yeah, it remains true that if we predict successfully on the basis of a certain expl explanation, we have a good reason and perhaps the best sort of reason for accepting the explanation. Yeah. 
So, but yet, if prediction is so important, uh, well, we would actually expect that this is what people do, right, in the social sciences. But actually, if you really think about it, this is not really true. I mean, what we typically do is simply test some type of model in terms of uh, we check for relationships, we maybe look at the model fit, we look at the explanatory power, the R square, but we don't really look into prediction. And this has been recently bemoaned in uh, an article in Science, it was about the prediction explanation of social systems. And then this article, we also said, well, you know, the prediction driven explanation. So you look into prediction and then try to explain phenomenon that predicted it has proven uncontroversial in the physical sciences. Yeah, but social scientists and contrasts have generally de-emphasized the importance of prediction relative to explanation. So rather than asking whether a theory can predict some outcome of interest, the accepted practice in social sciences instead asks whether a particular coefficient in an idealized model, it's like criticism here, yeah, is statistically significant and in the direction predicted by the theory. So what we do is actually look into explanation, but we don't engage in prediction. Well, I think you can mirror this, right? And um, it is, on the other hand, a bit um, surprising because actually, when we write up our articles, we often define prescriptive statements. You know? For example, like in our article here in the Journal of the Academy of Marketing and Science, on the one hand, we set up a set of hypotheses, which you can see on the left-hand side, H1, H2, H3, and then we test these hypotheses using complicated statistics, but at the same time, in the managerial implications sections, we derive concrete recommendations for practice. And these concrete recommendations for practice generally read like the following, like our results suggest that managers should do this and that, or if they do this and that, they will benefit from this activity as follows. So what we typically do as researchers, we frame these managerial recommendations as prescriptions. They foreshadow a certain event that will occur if a certain activity is being implemented. And this is a predictive statement, but yet we never test our models from a predictive standpoint. So this is what this talk will be all about. And we're going to be talking about prediction in the context of structural equation models. So this is a structural equation model, which might look familiar to you. Um, it comprises the so-called structure model and the measurement models. The structure model defines relationships among unobserved latent variables. Yeah, so variables that measure concepts which can have multiple meanings like attitudes, perceptions, or intentions. And we have the measurement models that actually define how these latent variables are actually being measured using indicators, which can come from survey data. They can also come from other data sources, secondary data, you name it. So what we typically do as researchers, we um, specify such, such a structure equation modeling based on theory and logic. Then we gather data in order to test whether these hypothesized relationships are actually observable in the real world. Well, in order to make a statement whether these, observable, uh, these um, relationships are actually observable, we need to test the model, right? We need to estimate it. And there are broadly two ways of doing this, um, which you actually might be familiar with. There are so-called factor-based structure equation modeling methods and composite-based structure equation modeling methods. So factor-based is what we typically would define as covariance-based structure equation modeling. Here, um, the uh, researcher assumes that these concepts that he or she wants to measure in the structure equation model can be faithfully represented by factors. So factors like in an exploratory factor analysis are simply defined based on the indicator correlations, more precisely based on the common variance, the variance that is shared by these indicators. That's what makes them factors. These correlations are actually used as input to estimate the model. So it st all starts with these indicator correlations, more precisely the common variance, so the joint variance of these indicators. So computer programs such as AMOS, Lisserl, and M routinely carry out factor-based SEM. 
Well, <clears throat> the other school of thought, which basically originated from the same uh, researcher, which was Herbert Walt, is composite-based SEM. And there are actually numerous compos composite-based SEM methods out there. You can basically conceive uh, regression with some scores as a kind of uh, composite-based SEM method, but more prominently here, of course, partially squares, structure equation modeling, or generalized structural component analysis. So here, the concepts that are supposed to be measured are not represented by factors, but by composites. So what's the difference here? Now remember, with factors, we're actually using the common variance to identify these constructs. And when we use composites, actually we're using linear combinations of indicators to compute actually scores of these constructs. More precisely, so these composites then represents of the underlying theoretical concepts. So there's much to be said about these two methods. When should the one be used? When should the other be used? What are the implications for model testing and so on? Yeah, so I'm not going to be talking about that. What I'm actually interested in here is the efficacy for prediction. And factor-based SEM methods have a little problem because they are they produce scores of the latent variables which are indeterminate. What does that mean? Well, it means that there is an infinite number of different scores which will basically produce the same result. So the model that you saw on the previous slide will produce some estimates. There's an infinite number of different scores that you can um, generate which produces the exact same result. That's a bit of a problem because if we talk about prediction, well, what do we want to predict? We want to predict scores, right? But if these scores are not clearly defined, well, then the method is more or less unsuitable for prediction. This has been basically been shown a long time ago by uh, Schoenemann and Hagen, who used the factor scores uh, in a model to predict the dates of Easter Sunday in a certain time period. So these scores were actually representing intelligence factors from the U U.S. population. So what they did, they took a certain um, correlation matrix of these um, intelligence factors, reproduced the scores in such a way that they were able to perfectly predict the dates of Easter Sunday. So needless to say that there's no relationship whatsoever between these intelligence factors and the actual dates of Easter Sunday. Just to showcase that CBSEM or covariance-based SEM methods are grossly unsuitable for prediction. This is also what has been mirrored in the literature. So composite-based methods, on the other hand, um, here the situation is a bit different. Remember, composite-based means that the procedure takes the indicators and forms linear combinations of these indicators to generate actually scores of these constructs. The factors. Yeah. And these scores are by definition determinate. So there's something that we can predict. For those of you that have been working in the field, maybe this is not related to the question of whether we can measure something reflectively or formatively. This is on a different level. So when we talk about reflective and formative measurement, meaning what's the relationship that we assume between indicators and constructs, this is something that happens on the measurement theory layer. What we are talking about now is how these measures are actually being represented in the statistical model. So this is the type of model estimation. So because of this, when your aim is actually to predict, you need to use some type of composite-based SEM method. So we talk about composite-based SEM and prediction. There's lots of confusion out there because people simply talk about prediction without actually engaging in prediction. And here's why, because there are actually two types of prediction. There's the so-called in-sample prediction and the out-of-sample prediction. So in an in-sample prediction, we're actually using the data to generate estimates, and then we're using the ex exact estimates to predict the data that we have just used as input. The following figure shows this. So let's assume you have some sample data here on the left-hand side with four predictors, and let's just, let's just work with five observations. Here. And we have two outcome variables, y. Again, five observations. 
So when we estimate this model, we would use the entire information that we have, five observations, estimate the model, we get our parameters, weights, loadings, and beta coefficients. And with these information, we actually estimate the outcomes. Yeah, so we are combining these estimated parameters with the predictor values to generate predictions or estimates of these outcomes. So the estimates, well, we just computed them. We also know the true outcomes, so we just take the difference, which are the residuals. These are shown here. And the, these residuals are then serving as a basis for assessing the explanatory power or the in-sample predictive power of a model using, for example, the r square. However, <clears throat> this is not actually what prediction is all about. It's called in-sample prediction, but I personally believe that this is a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, because this is actually not what prediction is. Prediction means that we actually try to predict unseen data, new data that was not used in the model. And this is what it looks like. So we take the sample data and split it up into a training sample and a holdout sample or testing sample. So the training sample is actually being used for model estimation. So same thing as before, but this time we don't use all five observations, but only three. Again, we get the weights, loadings, and the betas. Now, we are combining these estimates with the predictors of the testing data, the holdout sample, to generate predictions for the outcomes. So again, these two observations, the last one, observation four and five, were not used in the model estimation. Mm -hmm. But we, with these predicted outcomes, we can now compute the prediction error because obviously we know the true values, the true state of y for these two observations four and five. And the difference is now not referred to as the residual but as the prediction error. So <clears throat> we can now take this prediction error and quantify it in one or the other way. For example, using these metrics that you see down here like the RMSE, MAR, MAE, MAPE and so on. So the number one procedure that's being used in uh, PLS is PLS predict. And this is a recent advance because it just has been introduced like a couple of years ago, but only last year uh, we have provided like concrete guidelines on how to use this method. So the logic here is similar to what we just saw. We're splitting the data set up into a training sample and a testing sample or holdout sample. Again, training samples being used for model estimation, holdout sample is being uh, held out, as the name suggests clearly, and is used for estimating the prediction error. Again, there are different types of prediction statistics that we can use. Uh, the common one is the first one here, the root mean squared error of prediction, which just takes the uh, divergence between what we predict and what we observe, takes the, um, or, um, takes the um, uh, takes it to the power of two, divides it by the number of observations and then draws the square root of this. So we can also use the MAE mean absolute error. This has some advantages uh, in some situations, but as I said, the standard metric is actually the RMSE. However, it's not that easy, yeah, because PLS predict does not simply divide the data set into a training and holdout sample once, but it does this repeatedly using a procedure called k-fold cross-validation. So in k-fold cross-validation, actually the data set is split up not into two parts, like the <coughs> training holdout sample, but into k different parts. These parts are roughly of the same size. So for example, if we have 2,000 observations, we would set k to 5 for the, well, each of these so-called folds or groups, as we can also see them, would have 400 observations. So what's happening now? Well, we have these five groups with 400 observations each. And well, now we would take out the first group, use this group as a holdout sample and estimate the model using the remaining groups. So 1,600 observations would be used for model estimation, 400 observations would be held out, estimate the model, generate the prediction statistics, and then we move to the second fold. In the second fold, we're actually not taking the first group out, but the second group, repeating the entire thing, getting out the prediction statistics. Then we estimate the model again, leaving the third group out, 
After that, we leave the fourth group out. And finally, the fifth group. So each observation has been held out once. This is why it's called K-fold cross-validation. You can imagine that it's like a sheet of paper, which you fold into equal parts, and then you take one fold out in each run. So <clears throat> this assessment or, or assignment of the observations into the different folds is a random process. So it's done randomly, but well, you know, if there's some done, if this is done randomly, there might be some extreme cases. So it could well be that simply because of this random process, you put very extreme case in the one group. Um, to make sure that this doesn't significantly impact your results, you can run the entire procedure repeatedly. So with our repetitions, and generally we would set R to 10, meaning that we run this K-fold procedure, which I just described, 10 times. So how is such a result being evaluated? Well, there are basically two types of statistics that we look into. Um, we look into the uh, Q square, which is the mean value and the so-called linear model. Well, why are we looking into these two types of statistics? Well, the reason is that the prediction statistics like the RMSE and the MAE are actually depending on the scale of the indicators that you're looking at. So it makes a difference whether we try to predict, let's say, income, or whether we predict a Likert type variable, which is measured on a scale from one to five. Because on you know, a scale from one to five, well, there's not too much room for error, right? But if you want to predict income, well, you can be way off. Yeah? So what these two um, situations have in common that an RMSE of zero is the best possible case, but that's not going to happen. So the absolute value of the RMSE doesn't tell us anything. We need some type of standard of comparison. The mean value, the Q square, simply uses the mean value of the training sample to predict the testing sample. This is the most naive thing that you can do. So we're simply using the training sample uh, mean as standard of comparison and we want to beat this super naive benchmark. Well hopefully our results are going to be better than simply taking the mean right I mean there would be no point in setting up the entire model but we can go one step further we should look into a linear model and this linear model just takes the indicators that we seek to predict and uses the exogenous constructs indicators as independent variables to predict this specific indicator. So I'm just going to show you an example to make a case what's happening here. So let's say we have this model here. It doesn't matter what this model is all about. Um, and our target variable is this one here, CUSL, which stands for customer loyalty. CUSL is measured with uh, three indicators, CUSL 1, 2, and 3. And let's say we want to predict CUSL 1. So what we can do now in a linear benchmark model is simply using CSL1 as the dependent variable in a regression. And the independent variables are the indicators of the exogenous constructs. In this case here, qual, perf, CSOR, and attractiveness. This is a naive benchmark because it simply omits the entire model structure. So everything that's shown here in red is simply ignored. So we ignore that there are different constructs in this mod. We ignore that qual 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 belong to one construct, that perf 1 through 5 belong to another construct, and so on. So all of this is ignored. It's a super naive way. We have an input, customer loyalty, um, or the outputs, customer loyalty, and we have the input, these indicators of the exogenous constructs. So hopefully, our PLS model is going to be better than this linear benchmark model. And this is what we test using such a procedure here. So we first look into the Q square value, the training sample, and it's scaled in such a way that a value of zero or smaller actually indicates a lack of predictive power. So if this is the case, well, we can basically uh, conclude that the model lacks predictive power. If this Q square is larger than zero, well, there seems to be something going on, but is it good enough? in terms of beating the linear model benchmark. So in order to find this out, we need to uh, select first the prediction statistic of interest. So typically we use the RMSE. Yeah. So if the prediction errors 
are highly asymmetrically distributed, meaning they don't really follow a nice bell-shaped curve. Then there is a good reason to use the MAE, but the typical choice would be the RMSE. Now, what we do, for each indicator of a certain endogenous construct, we compare whether the PLS prediction produces a smaller prediction error than the LM. Yeah, so for each indicator, this is done. Yeah, so if all indicators of a certain construct, yeah, and if you reconsider our previous example, customer loyalty one, two, three, let's say for all these three indicators, the PLS model produces a smaller RMSE value than the linear benchmark model. Then we would conclude that the model has high predictive power. If um, the linear benchmark model is better in terms of prediction for all these indicators, we would say, well, there's a lack of predictive power. And then we can say, have a majority vote. So if the majority of indicators in PLS is better than in LM, then we have medium predictive power. And if the other way around, then we can say the model has a low predictive power. So I would encourage you very much to look into this procedure. Um, k cross validation in PLS, k cross validation is actually a standard procedure, which is very popular in um, data science. So you can also run this in any regression type analysis, and I would encourage you to do that. There's uh, some um, guideline articles here. First off, the article by Shmueli and colleagues in JBR in 2016, which uh, illustrates the procedure. And then we wrote a joint article in which we set up guidelines in the European Journal of Marketing 2019. So another thing that I want to briefly talk about is the act of comparing different models. And this is actually something um, that can frequently happen in research. So you have a certain theory which can suggest different type of model setups like the ones that you see here. And what we want to do now is we want to actually find the best model in the set. So this act of model comparisons is actually something that is, well, at the heart of science, yeah, because, well, there are different theories that you can use to explain a certain phenomenon. There are also different contexts. And then we have, we as researchers, we have to make a decision which of the model is the best representation of reality. And there's not this one single model, but there are multiple models that actually might work well. This act of model comparison is actually nothing new. It's frequently done in econometrics where you often start with the, what so called an over-parameterized model, so like a saturated model, which has all the indicators in, and then you'd gradually reduce the complexity to arrive at a parsimonious model, a smaller model, which fits the data well. There's also good reason from a conceptual perspective to engage um, in model comparisons, because we as researchers, we are also biased. So for example, when we establish a certain model, we actually have a confirmation bias. So we have a certain idea what this model can look like. We have a certain assumption what, will, what the result will be. And then we are just looking for confirming uh, or supporting information, ways to confirm our assumptions. This is a human bias that is simply happening also every day in consumer behavior, but we as scientists, we are also actually um, affected by this. And Luzo in a nice article in Nature said, well, model comparisons are a way to debias these assumptions. Yeah, so allow for different comparisons and use these different models and take the model which does the best job in explaining the phenomenon under consideration. There's also been, um, by the way, um, emphasized in PLS, numerous researchers have, have said that, well, the error scheme, the structure model is tentative, and we should understand the model construction process and the estimation process as an evolutionary process. Yeah? So it's really about um, finding the best model um, in a set of competing models. <clears throat> well, how do we do this? There are actually um, metrics that facilitate these model comparisons. Um, this young man here, Akaike, is the originator of the seminal metric here called the AIC, stands for Akaike Information Criterion. They're actually framed in terms of the log likelihood, but PLS is not a likelihood-based method. It uses the sum of squared errors. All these metrics are also framed as 
in the way of sum of squared errors, which you can see here on the right hand side. So you can apply them regardless of whether you're actually using a likelihood based method or not. So <clears throat> what we were actually interested in in one of our research questions was finding out which of these metrics performs best in prediction oriented model selection. So which of these metrics actually do a good job in selecting a well-fitting model, but this well-fitting model at the same time does a good job in terms of prediction. And when I talk about metrics, I'm not only talking about AIC and BIC, which you can see here on the slide, but they're like hundreds of different metrics. They're AIC3, AIC4, uh, HQ, um, and, and minimum description lengths, and so on. Um, so in our research, we first looked into model fit. And we found out that there are basically two criteria which do a fantastic job in terms of identifying the best fitting model. They're called BIC and GM. At the same time, this was a follow-up research here. We looked into the performance of these metrics in terms of their ability to predict uh, the values of our target constructs. And we found out that the BIC and GM again so if you're actually interested in achieving a sound trade-off between <clears throat> model fit and prediction, use the BIC and GM criteria as a standard of comparison. So how is this done? And see that here, we have these three models. They produce, for example, these following BIC values. And these BIC values are not scaled in a certain way, like zero to one, but they are, we interpret them as the more, so the smaller the value, the better the model. So they are just relative metrics. Yeah? So we take a look at these different models and pick the model with the smallest BIC value, which would in this case here be model number one with a BIC value of minus 328. <clears throat> we can actually go one step further and actually compute relative likelihoods of these, um, of these models. So a weight of evidence for a certain model <coughs> and these, um, Weights of evidence call, are actually called archaic weights. And see the different uh, computations here. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you can just refer to uh, our paper in the Journal of Business Research, which you can see here on the bottom of the slide. So here's an overview of the, um, the different papers that I basically talk about in uh, Journal of the Association of Information Systems, Decision Science, and the Journal of Business Research. If you're actually more interested in uh, the first paper, we recorded a nice video on a platform called Latest Thinking, um, where we describe or where I describe actually the um, computation of these different metrics and our corresponding study. Well, <clears throat> finally, some outlook. Uh, obviously, we are still working in that field and uh, we just published a nice paper on um, a statistical test, which you can use to assess whether one model is significantly better than the other model in terms of prediction. This test is called CVPAT and it's actually available also as an R code on GitHub. So <clears throat> three key takeaways. First off, <clears throat> if you're interested in causal prediction, um, which is a fundamental uh, building block of the social sciences, well, composite-based uh, methods excel. Um, I would always suggest using PLS or GESCA in that regard because, um, well, factor-based methods are grossly unsuitable for prediction. Well, when you talk about prediction, you actually need to assess the predictive power of your models. So in order to do that, rely on PLS predict, rely on predictive model comparisons and the newly proposed CV path. Well, with that being said, I think my time is over. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope to see you soon in person. Thank you.